platforms, featuring a series of partner events which will highlight your favorite products, manufacturers, artists, and more. Join us every day at 2 o'clock p.m. from November 1st through December 20th for exciting interviews, live audience Q&As, and a chance to win special prizes. Head over to the Fishman YouTube channel now to subscribe and set your notifications so you don't miss out on any of these events.
Hello everyone, this is Ken Susi here, your host, and we're doing another Fishman Partnership Series live across all of our social platforms. So if you're on the Fishman Facebook, our Twitch, our YouTube, you are now watching us live. Today we have some very special guests, a very familiar guest, but we have Guild Guitars on the line. And obviously the partnership series is based around our relationship with the companies that we work with. Obviously we put a lot of... Uh, time and effort into our products as well as they do but the most important thing is that we have such a great relationship with these companies and we're trying to highlight that and get you familiar familiarized with the people that we talk to on a daily basis and hear all the behind the scenes uh discussions that happen and all the products that we've worked on so uh just to be really clear uh head over to www.fishman.com Head over there, check out our great products that we make. We have a, a great support team. Uh, we have, uh, you know, the, as you see in the triple play, the loud box, Fishman Fluence Pickups, a lot of great products. And most importantly, hit the like and subscribe button if you're watching on Facebook. If you're not on the Fishman Facebook, head over there, click the like and subscribe button, and uh, that's it. So um, we, I absolutely love this. You guys show up every single week. We're always going live at two o'clock p.m. Uh, you guys are all saying hello, hello, hello. And a lot of you guys are coming over from the Guild Facebook page where we're also broadcasting. So do them a favor, click the like and subscribe on their pages. Uh, definitely ask some questions today. We're, we have a really open conversation. This is my favorite right here. Hi, Josh. People already know who our guest is. Before I uh, put him on the screen, I'm going to say hi to my lovely co-host, Mr. Rob Ketch. How you doing? I'm doing good, Ken. How about you? I'm living the dream, and I love the fact that we have this nice orange light. You look like you're in the Empire Strike Back <laughs> in the back there. It looks fantastic. But anyway, guys, I'm very happy to announce our good friend, You've seen him once before, but now he's here again. Mr. Josh Chapman from Guild Guitars. How you doing, Josh? Hey, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me, Ken. Uh, it's great to see you again. You're such a great guest, and now your 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 video looks amazing. It's new and improved. <laughs> you get the blurry background, the guitars. Uh, we were making a joke, everyone, before the live feed that he looks like he's a real YouTuber now. <laughs> so... Um, so anyway, let's 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 move forward here. So Josh, we all know that you're a great guitar player and you have uh, had many guitar building and technical experiences. Just tell us a little bit about your background, how you got into music, what led you led you to guitar, and most importantly, how did you even arrive at Guild? Yeah, great great question. So like most people uh, in our industry, you know, I started as a player. Um, right off the bat, I, you know, middle school started playing trumpet. Um, it's oddly enough, I found a lot of guitar players started with trumpet when they were uh, forced to pick a band in, uh, instrument in school. Kind of interesting. Um, started with trumpet and then found my way to electric bass, uh, which kind of led me into uh, the world of steel strings. Um, from there um, into high school, I was playing a lot of guitar, a lot of bass and Really, by my sophomore year of high school, I knew, all right, I'm going into the music industry. Um, of course, as a player from the start, kind of my dream, as I'm sure many people's uh, dream, was to be a studio musician. Um, at the time, I was in Minnesota uh, looking around the studios there. Not a whole lot of options um, as far as, you know, sitting in and, and cutting tracks with people. Um, so real quick, I kind of realized that there, there would need to be a more structured plan is how I'd get into the industry. Um, and with that, I actually found Southeast Technical College, um, which is a school in Minnesota uh, that teaches guitar building and repair. Um, really cool two-year program. I attended that school uh, fresh out of high school. Um, they taught everything from basic setups, um, just getting your guitar up and running, uh, to building an acoustic guitar from scratch, um, you know, straight uh, pieces of wood, cutting it to the top, um, cutting, you know, brace shaping, all of that, um, all the way down to advanced technical repair. So um, doing finish repairs, um, spraying finish, doing neck resets. And I really kind of cut my teeth there at that school, learning all these skills. Um, immediately out of that program, I knew that I, I wanted to go farther in, ideally into R&D and development. Um, so I found myself working on business classes at the same time as my schooling um, in the technical field. And from there, um, I actually got uh, reached out to Guitar Center um, and actually ended up with an opportunity to come out to California from Minnesota uh, to work for their repairs team. Um, so I was working at Guitar Center, their corporate office for three years, 
Um, I was working alongside a lot of great people there uh, running the repairs program. So working on training for guys, um, doing a lot of technical interviews, um, you know, making sure that techs knew what they were talking about as we were considering hiring them for our stores. Um, and, and I eventually reached a point where I really wanted to pursue my dream of working in the industry on building guitars uh, rather than just repairing and training. And so I ended up um, uh, leaving Guitar Center, and that's how I found my way to Guild. And when I started at Guild, uh, I actually didn't start in our office. I started right here in Oxnard, California, in our factory. Um, so for about a year, I was working in the finish line in our factory, um, doing finish repairs, a lot of touch-up work, um, level sanding, um, and really involved in, in the production of our instruments. Um, while I was there, I was kind of looking into ways that we could uh, streamline our processes, started introducing a few ideas um, to how you know um, instruments would, would flow through our line and flow through the finish department, uh, which ended up getting the attention of some of the managers here, uh, John Thomas, for instance. Uh, he actually stopped in and talked with me one day and said, hey, what, what are you looking to do in your career? You know, Where do you see yourself uh, moving forward with this company? Uh, and that was kind of the ultimate opportunity for me to start talking about my background in guitar building, guitar design, uh, and guitar playing. And that led me uh, to my position where I am now uh, as the director of product management, um, where I'm actually overseeing our R&D. Um, so a lot of hands-on, we've got a pretty small team here, um, a lot of hands-on work. So I'll be doing everything from working um, on the drafting side, working on our designs, um, to working with our, our factory here in Oxnard, as well as our uh, factory partners uh, across the, the seas. Um, so doing a lot, of, a lot of work on what our instruments are and making sure that, you know, they're the best instruments we can make. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, as you were saying that, I, and your story is incredible because, I mean, you start off at Guitar Center, you end up in a new company. Unbelievable stuff. I love, uh, as you're talking, the, the questions are popping up, but I love this right here. It says we're going to learn about Guild Guitars. So that segues <laughs> us nicely into the next question. And guys, again, I'm, I'm popping these questions right up on here. So if you have any questions for Josh, we're going to be taking your questions. But Guild is obviously one of the one of the great American guitar brands, and also has such a unique company history. Uh, for our watchers today uh, the, that don't know Guild or not very familiar with Guild, can you share a quick history of the Guild brand? Yeah, sure. Um, so when you're looking at Guild's history, it really starts in 1954, and um, that's when Guild became a company. And it really started through Alfred Dronge. Um, he's the founder of Guild Guitars. And Alfred Dronge um, actually came over from Poland. He was an immigrant. And while he lived in New York, uh, his first job was working at a music shop. Um, he fell in love with music, uh, found himself a player. Um, he actually was quite an accomplished player himself. He would go and tour um, with a couple bands, um, playing mainly dance music. But he found himself playing more jazz. Um, and as he got into his adult life, uh, he looked into starting his own music shop. He kind of fell in love with that whole scene. Um, he started initially a shop that was about uh, repairing instruments, so really well known for um, selling used instruments as well as repairing them. Um, and through that, actually ended up getting into accordion importing. Um, and this was around the time when accordions were really big, a uh, really popular instrument. So he was one of the main importers in New York uh, who was taking uh, the accordions, buying them from Italy, and then reselling them. Uh, and during this boom, he actually made a small fortune, um, believe it or not, off of accordions. Um, as he looked uh, what to do with this money and how to reinvest it, right around the same time, uh, Epiphone Guitar Company was, was originally based in New York. Um, so before Epiphone was owned by Gibson, they actually were their own guitar company, uh, primarily building archtop instruments. So right around the same time uh, Alfred Dronge was looking to reinvest this money, uh, the, the New York-based Epiphone factory actually closed and moved to uh, Philadelphia. So right there, um, in talking with um, one of the, the higher-ups at, at Epiphone who previously was running that factory, he realized there's an opportunity to start a guitar company. Um, so that's actually really where Guild started in the first place, um, was in New York with a lot of the old Epiphone employees. So when you look at the 1950s guilds, like I said, we started in 54. Um, when you look at the guilds that were made in 55, 56, most of the first models that came off the line uh, were full hollow body uh, jazz guitars. So F holes, arch tops. And that's where Guild actually got its start, partially due to Alfred Drange's love of jazz. 
Um, so there's a kind of a, a symbolism there where, where they came together, where Epiphone was making these, um, the guild guitars, the workers came in and knew how to make those arch top style instruments. Um, so that's really where guild got its start. Uh, real quick into that, uh, about two years in, they started making flat tops as well. Um, so actually, if you see F um, in like our F2512 uh, or any of our jumbo size models, that F actually initially stood for flat top. Uh, because they made those different types of instruments. Um, after after um, it was established, the Guild Factory actually moved to Hoboken, New Jersey, um, and then proceeded to move several times. Uh, as Ken mentioned, we had a pretty interesting history in that Guild has passed hands of ownership several times um, throughout the course of its life. Um, really one of the, the bigger owners, as we all know, was Fender. Um, they, they acquired the company in 2001, and Cordoba Music Group uh, ended up uh, acquiring the company in 2014. Um, so throughout that time, um, the factory actually moved from several places, Hoboken, uh, Westerly, um, Rhode Island, it went to Corona, Tacoma, uh, Washington, just a lot of uh, various locations of these factories. Each, each transition and change actually implemented new building styles, um, as well as uh, different educational pieces from working with those different workers. So it's really cool that in that, that vein of moving from place to place, Guild also picked up um, little bits of improvements from each factory each time it moved. Uh, but now we're here, we're based out of Oxnard, California. Um, and one of the really, the, the great things about Guild where we are is there's a very much a sense of home. Um, everywhere from the office workers, um, our, our guys in our warehouse, our guys in the factory, all of us feel a lot of pride in such an old brand, almost 70 years old. And rather than feeling like we're, you know, continuing the, the uh, trade of just kind of passing it around, we really feel like we've taken Guild to its home. Um, when Cordoba Music Group um, uh, got the brand, one of the first things they did was build the factory here in Oxnard. And that was our first step in saying, we're, we're tired of Guild moving around. We know it's one of the greatest brands um, that makes acoustic guitars, and we really want to make sure that we do right by that legacy. And so that's where you'll actually see when we started making guitars uh, here in Oxnard, we started up the same way that they started initially um, in Westerly, Rhode Island, which was making just the 20 Series M's, which are our simpler models, and then working our way up all the way to our D55s, um, you know, with tons of inlay on them. That's awesome. You touched upon so many things that are popping up here. That's that's an amazing overview of, of the of the company. But uh, you mentioned jazz at one time. We have a question. I have a bunch of questions rolling in. Josh, are you a jazz man? I didn't know why that <laughs> popped up at first, but as you're talking, now people are asking you if you're into jazz. I would like to say that I am. Um, <laughs> probably some of my playing styles would resemble resemble jazz. I mainly finger pick both on electric and acoustic guitars, uh, but I would not by any means say that I'm a jazz man. <laughs> I mean, I listen to it, but as far as playing, yeah. probably not. <laughs> okay. All right. So um, another one, I, I really like this. I'm just going to put it on the screen because I think it's just really great. But my, my uncle inherited a guild acoustic passed down from my great grandpa. So he's just making a statement that that, that guitar is staying in the family. I think that's really genuine and pretty cool. Um, but you mentioned the 20 series M models. Um, Terry, jo uh, Terry, sorry, Tosh is saying, I love my M25E. Did you play a role in its development? Uh, that's, that's a really good question. That is one of our most recent models. Um, I would like to say yes, but more I probably allowed its development uh, to come full uh, fruition. Um, really, that was one of our head luthiers. Um, it's pretty cool. We've got uh, some guys back there who really know what they're doing. Um, we were walking through doing a tour of the factory one day, and that actually came about as one of our M models uh, that doesn't have binding traditionally uh, ended up with an issue on the edge where the binding would you know, potentially go, but there's no binding on that model. Um, so our head luthier looked at it and went, you know, I could bind this and it could still shoot through. Um, so they ended up putting that white binding that you see on the M25. And then uh, once that hit paint, uh, he picked it up and said, you know, if I'm doing something kind of new and cool, why don't I try out a new burst? Um, and that's where we came up with the California burst. Um, so I, I couldn't say that I, you know, had a direct hand in developing this model, um, but it really was kind of a, a really uh, wonderful situation where I was presented it and it was pretty much done. Uh, one of the cool things about that model as well is that's one of the, the few that's coming out of our factory right now that has a gloss finish on the top and the headstock, as well as a satin back and sides. But that, that finish on that model is gorgeous. <laughs> totally. Well, you, I mean, while we're on the topic of history, I'd like to kind of move into this too. 
Um, can you please name some of the famous players that you basically relied on as far as like the guild players over the years? Uh, I think that's important because obviously as the company changed hands, I'm sure a lot of the players stayed the same. Yeah, um, you know, Eric Clapton, Brian May, Muddy Waters, um, Kim Thalen, uh, famous for using his Polera. Um, you know, we've got a long legacy of, of players, and like you said, a lot of them still use our guilds. And, and one of the even more beautiful things about guild guitars and how long they've been around is that we have plenty of artists who use guild guitars that we've also never talked to, um, which is really a wonderful thing, which if you're playing a guild, please reach out to us. Um, but it's really the wonderful thing about our company and, and the legacy, you know, kind of the comment we, we, we heard earlier of these guitars being passed down from grandfather to grandchild. Um, that's the beauty of our instruments. Um, you know, Nora Jones, even even Bob Marley, um, tons of players have used our instruments. Um, and it's and it's great to still see that and many of them reach out to us today and are still partners with us as well. Nice, nice. Well, real quick, I'm going to ask you one more question, then I'm going to kind of pass it off to Rob Catch because there's a lot of uh, Fishman pickups and or Guild guitars that, that, that need to be discussed right now. But um, yeah, was there a particular... So with all the new guitars, right? Was there a particular player that you had in mind when you were designing the guitar or you were kind of designing it kind of in a silo? That's, that's a really good question, and I wouldn't necessarily use the term silo, but we definitely haven't aimed at specific uh, players. It's more playing style and more what's best for the instrument. You know, it's, it's a really delicate thing designing new instruments for a brand like Guild um, because we have so much legacy and we have so many great products already. Um, so it's kind of a toss-up that's hard between keeping your line fresh and introducing new things as well as really holding down our legacy and the things that we're known the best for. Um, so a lot of what drives the new design and our new products are, are first and foremost, our lineage and what we can take from what Guild has learned from all of these factories, from all of these years of manufacturing instruments. Um, and really second is looking at what players need and not any particular player, but more so players as a whole. Um, we look a lot into the, the tone and the play and the feel of our instruments. And really one of the things that you'll see over and over again, we use it in our branding and we, we thoroughly believe it in our office too, is that our Guild guitars are made to be played. So anytime, whether we're working on a low end model or you know our most expensive model, we're always thinking, how is a player going to use this instrument? How is it going to feel for them? How is it going to sound? And how is it going to help them write their next song or make their song sound exactly the way they want it to? Nice. Well, right, be right before I pass you off to Rob, um, another Rob here is saying, popular story, I think, but many of our older family members had Guild. My dad had one too. <laughs> so everyone's popping in saying they had one. That's pretty cool. And Greg has a really, I, I think this is one you can answer really quickly, but it's a cool question. Are Guild guitars only acoustic? <laughs> no, they are not. Um, we do also make electric solid bodies as well as electric hollow bodies. Um, so if you haven't seen our electrics yet, check out the Guild Starfire line. Uh, that's a good place to start. Uh, awesome semi hollow bodies, really classic looking designs. Uh, and then we do also have some really kind of cool radical solid bodies as well, like our S200 T-Bird. Awesome. Josh, thank you very much. Fantastic story about the history of the brand. And, and some fresh thinking regarding your new designs. Uh, I had a, a guitar style question. Um, Guild, of course, makes great electric guitars, famous for jazz guitars, flat top guitars. Two of the categories that I think Guild appears to be v most famous for are jumbo guitars and 12 string guitars. I wondered, if you could share a little bit your thoughts being a guitar designer, what what has contributed to the incredible success and kind of long wearing um, attraction to these these couple of very specific guitar designs? Yeah, re really good question. Um, and you know, the, the first kind of quick answer is in a way the two of them are kind of intertwined, um, being our 12 strings and our jumbo body shape. Um, where the jumbo body shape in Guild really picks up its own voice and this kind of iconic sound that people go back for over and over again is first and foremost the overall size of the body. Um, our jumbo acoustic guitars are really some of the largest body jumbos, uh, which is what gives them such an extreme voice and such a unique voice that you hear and go, wow, that's definitely a Guild. Um, so one of the first things is the overall body size. Um, the second thing is our bracing patterns. 
Um, the, the great part about our company is that we've made such amazing guitars for so many years um, that we don't have to start from scratch when it comes to looking at voicing new instruments. Uh, we, have, we have tons of years of lineage to lean on. Um, and with that, we really have great sounding acoustic um, right off the bat, especially our jumbo models. Um, on top of that, another thing that really combines with the, the 12 string and our jumbos in general is the arch back construction that Guild uses. Um, so if you look at the backs of our uh, maple jumbo bodies, um, we actually have an arch back and it's a press. It's, a, it's three layers. It's usually maple and then mahogany and then maple. And we press those into that arch shape that you see. And what that actually does is it gives the internal um, sound cavity of that instrument a lot more projection. And it really helps to push those notes outside of your sound hole. So not only do you have a large diaphragm uh, at the top, kind of the vibrating section of this guitar, but you also have a really large sound port that pushes that out through, which gives you a really full sound, not just in volume, but also in frequency. It really helps to pick up the highs and the lows. And that's where the 12 string really combines with that jumbo body to make an excellent instrument because the 12 string has so many nuances between the lower strings as well as the higher octave strings. And so by using that jumbo body, uh, the large body size, the bracing, as well as that arched back, you get a lot of projection and a lot of clarity of each single string. Um, which is why really when you hear a guild jumbo, you know it's a guild jumbo because of how crisp every note comes through on those chords. That's awesome. Actually, someone's asked, uh, not to interrupt, but popping in here, do you do uh, the new models come at left-handed? Uh, yeah, we do have a few left-handed models. <laughs> All right, just yeah. want to make sure. <laughs> um, Rob, right back to you. You bet. Josh, thank you very much for, for telling us the story of the 12-string and the jumbo body shape. Um, the archback construction, is that something that evolved from the jazz guitar history, do you believe? Or was that, was that implemented you know, first in the flat tops? But it, it seems like it would come from that world. Yeah, that's actually spot on call out. Um, a lot of our uh, instruments today, any of our hollow bodies are made using the same method that press. Um, it's pretty common when you're getting those arches. And it may seem counterintuitive to press wood into shape um, as you're thinking about building an instrument. But what's interesting is when you push that arch into the top, it actually becomes stronger than it was before. Um, if you think about like a bridge, how often you see arc shapes in bridge design, um, that's because a bridge is pretty closely related to a triangle, um, which if, if most of you uh, remember, triangles are one of the strongest shapes uh, in nature or in man-made nature. Um, so by arching those backs, we actually make them more rigid. And that construction style, like you're talking about, initially came through on the um, arch top instruments. Um, when they were looking at making sure that the instrument built similar to a, an arch top guitar that is built similar to an upright bass or a violin could handle the tension of all of those steel strings, um, they first looked into arching those tops so that they could get enough, enough strength. Um, that's also why if you look on the inside of a flat top acoustic guitar, um, you'll notice that there are a lot more braces than there are on the inside of a arched um, instrument. And likewise, if you look into our maple guitars, our arched maple backs, you'll actually notice there isn't any bracing on the back of those instruments. And that's because that pressed arch is so strong that it doesn't actually require any braces across uh, the wood. Nice. Greg Jones is asking a question. I figure I can uh, throw this up since we're talking about wood. Does the Guild Company have a lot of old growth woods uh, build to their guitars moving forward? Uh, yeah, we do have a pretty large stock of, of wood. And one of the cool things as well, um, when Cordoba um, took on Guild, uh, the Guild Company, we actually inherited a lot of old wood as well. Um, so we've got quite a bit of stock of, of wood that's not only have we been waiting to make sure, um, which... I'll just clarify real quick. It's important when you're building an instrument to make sure that your wood is settled um, and is ready to, to be formed into a guitar. So not only do we wait and make sure that our wood is settled, most of the wood that we're using or that we've had has had time to sit before that even. Um, so we do have uh, quite a few stocks of well of some really nice woods that you'll probably see coming out uh, in, in smaller runs in the, in the future. Actually, this is kind of cool because two different people ask kind of a question within the same uh you know parameters so my 1980s uh jf212 xl uh has two truss rods in the neck do the newer 12s have them but also i'm going to ask you what's the fretboard material used rosewood or ebony 
So on our USAs, um, Ebony primarily, and then on our um, uh, 200 series or Westerly series instruments, um, Rosewood. And then to answer the second question about the truss rod, in our modern uh, current ma uh, manufacturing of our 12 strings, we use um, carbon fiber rods. So as opposed to two truss rods, which you can adjust if you look at my fingers, uh, the one issue with two truss rods is while they do work, you could adjust one and not the other, and now you're starting to get twist in your neck. Um, whereas what we do now in modern construction, we use two rods alongside the truss rod that adds stiffness, but that way when you adjust the truss rod, it's only the center that's moving as opposed to giving that potential for a, a twist. And not saying that you're definitely gonna twist your neck with dual truss rods, it just means that if someone is not sure how to adjust it, there is the ability to do that. And we wanted to make sure that our guitars are as easy to adjust um, as possible. That's awesome. That's awesome. So we're thrilled that Fishman, uh, the Fishman Sonotone Electronics are your choice pickups for these great new guitars. Uh, please share with the fans what led you to the Sonotone uh, to amplify your new models. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, and you know, one of the, the first comments there is, is once again, legacy. Uh, Guild and Fishman have been working together for years. Um, so we already knew that it's a trusted brand. Um, in, in the first place. And then as we acquired Guild and looked into it, um, we did do shootouts with a lot of different uh, manufacturers, different types of pickups. But one thing that you can always count on with a Fishman pickup is that it's always going to be reliable. Um, we, we didn't find nearly the reliability in tone and performance in any other of the pickup systems that we reviewed uh, for these models, which is why all across the board you see the Fishman Sonotone pickup system. Um, we're very happy with the tone that you can get out of it. Um, it sounds great right away plugged in. You do have the EQ controls as well to kind of dial it in. But really, when it comes to an acoustic guitar company uh, manufacturer like ourselves, when we're thinking about what electronics we're going to use on our instruments, one of the key things for us is that the tone that we spend so much time working into our acoustic instrument gets translated when you plug that into an amplifier. And really, with Fishman, we found that we could still hear our instrument's voice through the Fishman pickup systems, the Sonotone uh, specifically. Uh, so that's really what kind of led us to that decision is, number one, reliable as all heck. We always knew they were going to work. They always sounded uh, the same. And then number two, the fact that we could still hear the voice of our instruments through that pickup system was really important to us. Josh, thank you for the kind words on that. We really appreciate it, appreciate the partnership. Um, a little historical fact for the fans, uh, Guild was Fishman's very first OEM customer in the beginning of the company. And we're celebrating our 40th anniversary next year. So thank you for that. Thank you for your continued support. And thank you for all the guitar building knowledge. I was actually making my own Guild guitar over here with everything I had learned from you. <laughs> so uh, we appreciate you sharing the details. Um, and. You know, we covered the electronics, which is fantastic, but we talked about the unique voice of the instruments. So some of these new guitars that we're discussing today, I, I would love it, and I'm sure the people watching would enjoy it. If you could tell us a little bit more about these models, what the woods are, uh, what the details are, and everything that went into creating these great new guild models. Yeah, sure. Um, so the, the main models that we we're talking about here today are our Westerly series. Um, and so those are going to be our 200 and 100 series models. Um, primarily, we use spruce and or mahogany uh, for the top woods, and then the back and side woods can vary. Um, as we're talking about Guild 12 strings, um, really what comes to mind first is going to be our, our F512, um, which is our USA-made guitar. And really the next one that pops right in, into our mind is the F2512E. Um, and that, fish, that features our, our Fishman Sonotone pickup in it. And so when we look at the construction of these models, um, the F2512E, it's going to be a solid spruce top. Um, so really getting the full harmonic content that we can out of that top um, with the pressed back, inside, or pressed back. So like I was saying, it's made out of maple um, and it's pressed into that uh, position. So it's going to be maple back and sides. Um, and then they do have rosewood fretboard, rosewood bridge. Um, with 12 strings, uh, obviously. And really in the combination of that body and the, t the solid top is where you're going to get such great tones. Um, beyond that, we do have other versions of our 12 string. Um, behind me, I've got an F20 or F1512. Um, this is going to be in our 100 series. 
of the Westerly collection, which means that it's going to be all solid wood uh, manufacturing. So it's got a solid top as well as solid rosewood back and sides. Um, so really elegant sounding model, um, a little bit less projection than the, the pressed back, but you do get a little bit more nuances um, of tone. So you're going to get a little bit more harmonic content. And, and as you'll kind of frequently see with Rosewood, almost a reverb like tonality uh, quality to it. Nice. I'm throwing everybody on the screen right now because uh, it's a round robin. Let me just get Rob's audio up. Boom. Here he is. Yeah. <laughs> no, so, I so joe is asking um i love ebony i think that was a part of a past conversation but how accessible is the battery from the fishman controls uh and how sensitive is the setup to feedback would you need uh, a feedback buster so rob i think or josh either one of you guys could yeah rob do you know anything about fishman pickups uh you know um <laughs> no to 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 answer your question on the guild guitars that we're discussing um, they have our externally um, accessible battery hatch, which Josh will show you right here. So that's tool-free battery access right there. You can change it in seconds without using any tools, taking the guitar apart. Um, you won't be, won't be down for a minute. So it's right there, easily accessible. Um, as far as feedback goes, uh, the Sonotone system uh, electronically is very resistant to feedback you can play at a very high level um, anything will feed back at a certain point right at a certain SPL anything in the world will feed back but um, generally speaking the sonotone system uh, will will play at you know arena levels without any feedback issues so a feedback buster is not necessary um, and also Josh, I bet, can speak to the fact um, that the, the pressed backs and the really rigid construction of the Guild guitars, I would bet acoustically they've got some feedback resistance as well. They've always been incredibly stable guitars in an amplified situation. Yeah, correct. And the combination of those two, you know, the combination of the construction of our instruments with the, the feedback resistance of the sonotone, um, you have no issues whatsoever playing on a loud stage, um, getting feedback from this system. Nice. Nice. Okay. So we're also going to, he has actually a follow-up question to that. Joe is writing, what strings would you recommend for a Guild guitar? <laughs> uh, we use Diodario strings on, on our guitars when you get them stock from the store. Nice. There you go. And Greg is asking, which types of rosewood do you use? Indian, Brazilian? Uh, Indian rosewood. Brazilian rosewood would come on probably a $20,000 guild guitar. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's pretty hard to get Brazilian uh, nowadays, and it's very well regulated. Uh, so Indian is the main type of rosewood we use. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, so with Guild, you have a Maple 12 string guitar equipped with Fishman uh, that's ready to perform on any stage in the world for a reasonable price. Tell us the steps that you take to deliver such a quality instrument at a re that reasonable of a price. Yeah, definitely. Um, and that's really, there's three factors um, that really come into an instrument, you know, at a, at a level like that, um, that make, make sure that it's a playable instrument. And the first factor is going to be design. Um, and, and here we, we have the beautiful um, ability to rely on our guild designs as well as look at what we can do uh, to improve them. So number one is going to be design. The second thing that you really take into account um, when you're manufacturing an instrument you know, somewhere other than right across the street like our Oxnard factory is, uh, is going to be materials. Um, one of the, the things that we have at our Oxnard facility is we have the ability to select every single material that goes into our instruments. Um, when you're dealing with factories that um, you know, are far away from you, you don't necessarily have that ability. So it's, it's ensuring that the factory picks the right material. Um, we review the material with them and ensure that you know, this is the wood we want to use. This is the correct spruce. Um, this is going to have the sound qualities we want. This is strong enough for it. And then really the third factor is going to be... Um, the partners that we work with are factories and making sure that they can deliver the instruments that we want to make and that we will make with them. And when it comes to design, you know, it's an interesting thing. As I said, materials takes a, a big role and really sometimes materials will influence the design as well. Um, so being able to use uh, different types of stiffer woods that we can source more readily and more easily for our USA um, 
products, we're able to use you know, a, a thinner brace that's actually a lot stronger or as strong as a thicker piece of a wood that's not quite as stiff. Um, so sometimes when we when we review materials and we find that you know there is a material that works but it's not quite as stiff as the best material possible then we might end up just making that piece a little bit thicker and you'll still end up with a similar result in the end um, but it's it's all these you know kind of give and take um, um, relationships that you have to look into in your design process and to really make sure that the end instrument is something that could be played you know in someone's bedroom or on a stage um, in front of you know a hundred people um, and that's where we really look at in these, in these um, more affordable models. Um, it almost takes more time to really dial in and make sure that it stands by what we stand for with Guild. Um, and really making sure that it, it is a playable instrument, it's made to be played, it sounds as good as we expect. And there's a lot of um, really kind of scrutinization that we put into, look, into our uh, in instruments that come from other factories. Um, where internally we actually scrutinize them pretty intensely before they ever even are considered uh, leaving leaving our house or leaving our factory. Um, so it's a lot of uh, putting it through playing tests, um, putting them through stress tests, seeing how they'll behave with low humidity, high humidity. You know, uh, you should always humidify your instrument, just putting it out there, but making sure you know that they they um, stay together within different uh, amounts of humidity. Um, and so there's a lot of a lot of stress testing involved, a lot of making sure that the instruments stand up to what we believe our instruments should be. Um, but really, it comes down to those three things of making sure that our design is is spot on, that we're using the correct materials, and that we can trust our partner factories to make the instrument to our standards. That's amazing. I I, I was going to pass this off to Rob, but this is too good to pass up, Mr. Baked Potato is here and he's asking josh could you play uh, the beautiful guitar a little bit but i'm sure you're not going to do it it's fine if you don't want to but if yeah if you want to play the guitar a little bit just to show us how awesome it is can, it's fine i, I mean show that indeed i can play <laughs> mr baked potatoes out See, that's awesome. And if you, and if you want to check out any more, um, you know, clips, I'm sure you have it on your website as well as uh, YouTube. You can find out what model were you actually playing right there? That's the F2512E that we've been talking about. All right. So everybody head over to the Guild site and or YouTube and look up that guitar and check out what it's made of. I'm going to pass this off to Rob. Yep. Josh, once again, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for the great partnership. Um, Every time we speak, I learn something new about guitar building, so I appreciate it. Um, we have uh, some of the 200 series guitars here in our shop. They are great instruments. They do punch well above their weight, and um, you can tell all the love and care that you put into the guitars. So thank you for doing that, and um, we'll talk to you very soon. Awesome. Yeah, and I'm going to pop in real quick, just ask you one last question, and we actually have a Fishman employee asking the same thing. Josh, what, what are the new developments and or design at Guild that you're most excited about? Um, really, a lot of it is going to be on our electric side. Um, there hasn't been a whole lot of new Guild electrics um, or almost attention paid previous to um, our ownership, uh, Cordova's ownership. So one of the things that uh, you guys should really keep your eyes out for is going to be the growth in our electric line, um, looking at what we have. Um, and then I can also say that we've got a model coming up in the acoustic line, also going to feature a sonotone pickup that's going to be extending our acoustics into a range they haven't been in yet. Um, so that's a, that's a real exciting one coming up here uh, at, in January. That's amazing. Well, I'm flashing this all on the screen. As Rob said, goodbye. It's great yes. goodbye to you. I'm going to say it as well, too. Josh, it's been great having you again. Can't thank you enough. Can't thank uh, Guild enough for giving us your time to be on our partnership series today. Um, we'll see you next time. I'm going to send this off real quick. Everyone, um, you are watching the Fishman Partnership Series. Thank you so much. Today we had Guild Guitar. Uh, it was absolutely amazing. We may, we may or may not be giving you something away tomorrow at 2 o'clock p.m. So show up for our next event. Do us a favor. Head over to www.fishman.com check out all of our products. I also would advise anyone that watched the stream to head over to the Guild site, check out their instruments. Please do us the favor, like and subscribe to our pages. 
set your notifications so you don't miss out on any great giveaways. But until tomorrow, guys, we'll see you tomorrow at 2. I'm your host, Ken Susie. See you tomorrow.